up guys? Welcome to the Just Pearly Things YouTube channel and welcome to the sit down where I bring on different guests to talk about feminism, men and women's relationships and other topics. Before I start, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell. Let's get this video to 2000 likes. That's the most important metric that YouTube uses to push out these streams. Also get yourself a women shouldn't vote t-shirt today. You know, you guys know my opinion, the breakdown of the family, everything is beyond all because women got the right to vote. Get yourself a t-shirt. All the women will come up to you and say how awesome you are. <laughs> so welcome to the show, guys. Can you give the audience um, a little background? I'm starting with you, Paul. Yeah, I'm Paul Elam. Uh, my website is paulelam.com. I've been involved in working around men and men's issues for nearly 40 years now. My YouTube channel is an earformen.com. And you can also uh, find me at paulelam.com forward slash XY crew for our men's groups that deal with these very topics every day of the week. Okay, so I'm a divorced mother of three, remarried. Um, all my children are adults now and uh, gainfully employed and responsible citizens. I don't even know how that happened. But yeah, no, I, I've been involved in uh, men's rights and anti-feminism for about, well, since about 2010, when I started discussing the issues online. And what led me to be interested in them was that I was going through my divorce at that time. And you know how when you, when you, divorce, you have this extremely long detailed list, right down to every last little thing of what they did wrong. But if you don't want to have something like that happen again, you actually have to try and figure out what you did wrong. And because uh, it's never only just one person screwing up and ruining a marriage. So I stumbled, I was looking for answers and I stumbled across a men's website called the Spearhead and I started participating in the um, comment section there and uh, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal, but fair, but totally fair. And I started reading all of these articles about things like domestic violence and sexual assault and false allegations and divorce law and alimony and child support laws and all kinds of things like that. And I thought, well, this is not the world I want my sons to grow up in. And it's definitely not even the world that I want my daughter to grow up in, because if you if you completely destroy the trust between that men have for women, how can your daughter be able to go out and form a relationship with someone who's trustworthy? If he's always if he's pretending to trust her not to screw him over, then it's because he's planning to screw her over. Right. So I, I was just like, no, no, this is not a good way to form families and uh, have a functioning society. And uh, so I just started talking about it. And, you know, there was an aspect of someone is wrong on the internet uh, as it's, well. It's um, funny when you I can't, first... I can't, I can't leave people to say stupid things and then just walk away with nobody pushing back on them. So Well, it's funny when you first, like, get into the red pill space as a chick. Because, like, I, I think we're just so used to being, like, pandered to 24-7 that you hear it, you're like, oh, wow, this is how... This is what guys think and it's kind of like a oh. it's kind of like a shock at first but then I don't know how it was for you but for me I was like oh this is actually helpful to know I was like this is mm -hmm. actually like useful information I think there's two different kinds of women out there that get in into the red pill space and there are those who look at the pushback from men and say well given what they're living with and working with every day this is understandable uh, it's not pleasant it's not pretty but I get it this is the way they feel and the, there's lots of women that get into the red pill space also that get some of that pushback and all of a sudden we're evil <laughs> and we're yeah. everything feminists have, uh, have always said we were. So I like those guys out there given the pushback for the for the reason that it really gets the non-hackers out of the way so that women who really want to speak to these issues can. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have them. They're they're a very, very, very effective vetting committee, basically. You know, if you're if you're real, you'll stick around. And, you know, I saw a couple of women who were like totally on board with the guys at the spearhead until, you know, one of them said something particularly insulting about women and 
or maybe oh. was rude to them. And then they pulled their woman card and said, well, you can't be rude to me. I'm a woman. And, you know, you don't treat women like that. And they were like, yeah, you can go fuck off now. <laughs> you know, and, and they would get booted out. And it's like, no, you can't, you can't, these guys are being honest about how they feel. And they are often being brutally honest because that's the only way anybody's ever going to care is if this guy is so shockingly honest that it snaps you out of your uh your malaise and you actually have to pay attention to him it's it's like it's like the difference between someone um, uh, a man standing on the sidewalk yelling at people well you got to pay attention to that guy as opposed to a man lying on the sidewalk you know under a pile of newspapers you know slowly dying yeah um well and I then had people the, just walk past so. i used to when i first like started watching the stuff i i would say like oh like why do they say it like that and then i realized i'm like oh it's just how guys talk but we're so used to being like pandered to that we're just not used to like the bluntness of it but i think it's good i feel like it, it, i feel like it's like overall it's a good thing because then you kind of understand how guys like think around you a little bit better yeah and, and keep and, in mind too the guys get pushback on this i i practice a lot of that bluntness in the work I do. And I can tell you, there's no shortage of guys out there pushing back on me saying I need to be Warren Farrell instead of Paul Elam. Uh, that's just sort of part of the vetting process for men, I think. Yeah, no. And, and I, I have a real hard time with, you know, when you look at Warren Farrell, I imagine two parents, right? So you have you have the one parent who calmly and quietly explains to the child, you know, why you're having a time out because you, you know, and why you need to, to clean your room or why you need to, you know, go to school on be on time and why you need to do things and, you know, be very reasonable and very calm and very quiet. And then every once in a while, you need a parent who's just just gonna put his foot down right and say no this far no further smarten up or you're gonna get your ass tanned and i mean you cannot have a men's movement populated only by warren ferrells you need the tip of the spear you need the spearhead of people who are rude and in your face and shocking and blunt and brutally honest right to basically soften up the audience to be willing to even listen to yeah. and entertain the positions of the warren ferrells out there because otherwise, you know, Warren Farrell is just never going to get anywhere. Yeah, they say I'm really mean. So, oh, they all say I'm really mean too. So, <laughs> you guys are cupcakes. <laughs> oh, Sachi Cool. Oh, I don't know if you know her, Sachi Cool. She's a Canadian. Uh, journalist no. uh but she works for uh she was working for buzzfeed and she put me on a netflix special and i sat down for 90 minutes with her and then about 40 minutes into the interview she says well you called me a cunt and i was like did i and what? she's like was she? yeah like six times and i'm like are you and she says are you denying it and i'm like no it sounds like something i'd say i just don't <laughs> recall i've called a lot of people cunts and uh I and mean, she's like was she well a you cunt? did like, like and, then my she, question. and then i'm like okay and then she's says well do you still think I'm a cunt and I'm I'm like yeah kind of <laughs> you know, and I burst out laughing, right? I wish I had been more on the ball. I would have like looked at my imaginary watch and said, "Well, we've been here for 40 minutes and you haven't given me a reason to change my mind." So, <laughs> you know, and she just sat through the whole thing looking like she I just forced her to eat bird poop. It was great. <laughs> my question today, I'm curious, so what is you guys' opinion of feminism as a whole? Uh, it has never not been rotten. Okay. You know, I don't know if I can add anything to that. It's it's been a hate movement from its inception, starting with Seneca Falls all the way up to today. It is populated by a lot of women who have big time issues with men and they express it politically through feminism. I'd say going back further than that, going back all the way to Mary Wollstonecraft, yeah. that she had, if you actually read about her life, she was deeply disturbed, probably borderline personality disorder or bipolar or something like that. Paranoid. Uh, she hated men. Uh, she hated her father. And uh, she never got married. She had a child out of wedlock. She tried to kill herself when she found that, okay, at this point, it's it's difficult to be a single mother. So I'm going to try and coerce the man who impregnated me into marrying me. And he wouldn't do it because she was crazy. And so then she tried to kill herself with this 
six-year-old or nine-year-old girl uh, daughter who was depending on her. And uh, because this guy said, no, I don't want to be married to you. And I'm guessing he was paying her some sort of uh, support. But it's like, I'm I'm looking at that. That is, that was the proto-feminist that gave birth to what occurred in Seneca Falls uh, 75 years later. And that, I mean, when you look at that document, the Declaration of Sentiments, and you, you read that one line, the history of mankind is a history of repeated usurpations and oppressions of by man against woman, uh, having indirect object at the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her, right? That is what they were saying. That was their description of the world as it stood in 1850. And then they just go from there and they make this list of all of the ways in which men have wronged women. And of course, none of the ways in which men have done right by women, none of the the sort of the trade-offs that were made uh, in terms of, yes, men have custody of the children by, by default. I mean, like there are ways of getting around that, but fathers have custody of their children by default, but that's because fathers paid for their children. They were the sole people legally responsible for supporting those children. So they they got them because they paid for them, but it doesn't say anything about that. And you look at all of the ways that they began to dismantle all of those norms, right? Well, men, they switched. They didn't say, ooh, let's go to equal shared custody on the part of mothers and fathers. No, it was custody to the mother, tender years doctrine. But oh, no reason to touch that... Um, that whole child support and alimony thing and the father being the sole provider for the, all the necessaries of his children and the head of their household, which is now the mother, right? Oh, no, no reason to look at that. No reason to think about that, right? So, or change any of that. So they really pulled uh, pulled one over on society and every single thing that they did with coverture was they, they took away all of the, all of the handicaps on women, all of the uh, restrictions on women, all of the limitations on women, and handed them everything they wanted, and then kept all of the obligation and responsibility and culpability and all of those things on men. Well, <clears throat> I mean, all of that is factually correct. Um, and, and most I, of this shit happened before women got the vote, just so you know. It's important to keep all this in mind, because what you'll hear most common, even from alleged conservatives today, is that Feminism was a movement with all the right ideas that somehow took a turn south and went in the wrong direction at some point, maybe in the late 1960s, early 70s, something like that. Uh, of course, that's a fallacy. Feminism was rotten from the beginning. I know that Karen's right, it predates Seneca Falls, but in Seneca Falls even, uh, men were invited to attend that convention and sit in the back with their mouths shut from the very beginning. That was the rules that the women put no forth at, at Seneca Falls. It's never been an inclusive movement that was about any kind of justice or anything of that sort. It was always about women getting all the power they could and exercising it against men. And this is exactly what we see playing out uh, in the social landscape today and politically and legally uh, across the board. Feminism has poisoned our society uh, in many ways. Um, but I think it's also really important not to forget that feminism is one side of a coin. Gynocentrism uh, as a whole is uh, tells a more complete picture because you've got people like our friends at the Daily Wire and, and other places who are saying they're anti-feminist and then turning around and just parroting all sorts of adulation and deference to women and painting women as victims, using all the same language that feminism uses, just from a slightly different angle. And when you object to that, They'll say you're like the feminist. It's it's an interesting dynamic. But, but, uh, but Paul, that's the you're way not it a you're out. not a real man if you don't get married. Uh, absolutely, that meme. The unfortunately, the political right in I think North America. If there's a, is there Karen? Is there any more political right in Canada that exists anymore? Yes. Okay. Good. It's there. But what you get from these guys is that they will not talk about changing family law or fixing family law. They will talk about men needing to get married. But the moment men you talk about family, up. 
they need to step up and man up and and you know take the hit or whatever step up to the plate as fathers even if they catch fastballs between the eyes they need to to step up and do that and at the same time they're saying that they're anti-feminist it's it's a strange mix well i mean yeah. i think i think i think it's interesting too to note that i think wasn't it ronald reagan who who basically passed no fault divorce yeah. in, in United California States. the first governor in, to do that. Uh, yeah yeah and and it's like well okay yeah I can understand having no fault divorce right you know like you don't have to prove that he beat you you don't have to prove that he raped you you don't have to prove that he uh was uh, abusive or abandoned the family you don't have to prove any of that you just have irreconcilable differences and you can divorce him, you know, and you can do that unilaterally without having to prove fault. Okay, so you walk away with your share, a fair share of the marital assets that you both accumulated during the marriage. And that's it. That's it. Right. And you share custody of your kids. Because if it if no one if he if, if it's no fault, then you're basically saying he's not at fault either. Right. Mm -hmm. So you walk away. You don't have to you don't have to take him out for the rest of his life. Oh. There's a you know, like the well, whole lifetime alimony thing. I well, mean, I it's started Republicans who often uh keep that going. So it, it's infuriating to me where you have alimony. this like, well Republicans you in get... bed with feminists, you right? Get it for being married? Super like... awesome bedfellows there. But you know, like Rick Scott in um in Florida, he twice vetoed a bill that would get rid of lifetime alimony. And uh, at the behest of the National Organization for Women, he, that's what he did. And it's like because he thinks that, you know, a man's place is to be supporting women. And you can think that all you want, right? And I don't have any problem with that, right? Like I live in a in a marriage right now where my man financially supports the whole household and I take care of him and, you know, the home uh, as ineptly as often that is. But I, I look after all of those things that I take care of paying the bills. I take care of all the domestic stuff. I take care of all the cooking and he needs a lot of cooking and all of those things. I, I don't have a problem with even organizing society around those principles. You just can't have a society that's organized around those principles where you pretend that they don't exist and you make laws that don't enforce those principles. You make laws that actually counter uh, counteract those principles. So it's it's like basically we have this thing where it's like a woman can divorce a man in Florida for any reason or no reason at all and walk away and he has to pay her for the rest of his life and he never gets to retire. Um, his retirement is the day that he pulls out a gun and does that, right? And, uh, so it's, I, I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking, you know, if you want, if you want as a traditionalist Republican, right. Who believes in gender roles and who believes in, you know, this, uh, gender distribution of labor and who believes in, you know, marriage and who believes in all of those, then pick that, pick that and make laws that reinforce that. Right. Don't pick that right. In terms of what you're willing to say socially and then, you know, and then just do a whole bunch of stuff that completely contradicts it and makes it impossible to actually establish in real life. So. But here's the here's the problem that we keep facing with conservatives all the time is that they will again, they'll insist that men step up and volunteer for the abuse, but they will never speak about family courts yeah. because they do not have the spines to stand up to women. It, right. They will not put themselves in a role of being a seeing in competition or conflict with women. So they're, all they're left with is you need to get married no matter what, no matter how bad the deal is, no matter how corrupt the courts are, no matter how lopsided the laws are, you need to step up and do this. And by the way, when you say, well, fix the courts first, they go dead silent. Yeah. Uh, it's it's well, absolutely yeah. the, the hypocrisy and the lack of spine in conservatives over this matter is just staggering. Yeah, well, it's so it's so crazy because I I like, you know, when I first got into the red pill space, I didn't really understand people's like problem with marriage. I was like, what's the problem? My parents are married. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started like going into I started researching it and I started um, working on my divorce documentary. And I had this like realization. I'm like, a lot of guys would have been better off off if they never got married or had kids because I realized I'm like the women will turn the kids against the dad anyways and yeah. who, and God knows who the mom this the baby mother stepmom whatever brings like what dad 
is or what mail she br- he or she brings parade to- of uncles yeah yeah ex- yes. exactly <laughs> and so i'm like no there's because some of the guys it's like really sad when you talk to them they're like they're they're so like there's just nothing like a guy who who can't see his kids like it's just like the most devastating thing where he'll, he'll be like a mile away from them and he can't see them and he feels so powerless from this court system i'm like fuck if i was a guy i, I don't know if i'd sign up for this even if it was just uh no. like because you know they'll always try to downplay the stats like they'll try to like you know because I, I would argue that you seven- just didn't meet the right woman yeah, they'll be like, they'll be like, they'll be like, find a girl that prays. I'm like, have you seen the bitches that pray nowadays? <laughs> like, I'm not trying to be rude, but like, I mean, I, I've seen Kate, like, I I just got to the point where I couldn't find a right woman that I hadn't seen fuck over a guy. I'm like, I found the Muslim girl. I found the Eastern Europeans <laughs> that are supposed to be better. I found like the Russian the, the shit came girls. over here. Yeah, no, it's all of them. I'm like, it's just ice. I'm like, and so. So, you know, it, it just kind of made me realize that shit, like if I was a guy, I wouldn't sign up. The only solution if they really want to bring families together is to switch the courts because it's like this is two generations of men, at least, that have been screwed over by this court system. So, you know, guys are logical. They kind of weigh the pros and cons. They're like, I can't even get two kids out of this anymore. <laughs> and they're like, and I have to risk yeah. it all for well, one Well, yeah, point but five. they'll hate your guts by the time they're 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. And and why would you do it when you've got, you know, casual sex? And I tell my boys, right, you know, if you're going to engage in that, you bring your own condoms. You don't use the ones she has, right? You bring your own condoms, you use them, you take them into the bathroom afterwards, you rinse them out in the hottest water that comes out of the tap, and then you throw them in the trash. Don't flush them down the toilet because that's disgusting. And somebody has to scrape all that stuff off of the intake valves at the water treatment center. So, you know, don't make it hard for other men is basically what I'm saying. But but yeah, you need to protect yourself. And like my sister, when I started making my videos, my older sister, uh, she's six years older than me. She said she, you know, she had had the talk with her daughter who was, you know, uh, 13 or something at the time about, you know, the talk about boys and, you know, staying, staying on the straight and narrow and not giving into temptation and not letting anybody talk you into doing anything you shouldn't be doing and all of that stuff. Right. And she says, and then you started making videos and I started realizing I have to have that talk with my boys too. And so she's got, you know, his, her, her, her boys are sandwiched in between two daughters. And, uh, and so she gave them the talk about watching out for users, watching out for women who are going to lie, expect them to lie when they say they're on birth control expect them to be lying and uh, predict that you know they will sperm jack you if they can you know because and maybe only one in a thousand women will do this but that one in a thousand means a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar 26 year amortized baby mortgage and i think that that speaks to a bigger issue too than just marriage I mean, what we're talking about here is the fundamental lack of trust Trust. that that we can have, that men can have in women nowadays, because the potential damage doesn't isn't limited to marriage. I mean, there's paternity fraud, all kinds of things that go on all the time between women and men that this society won't talk about. But it fundamentally boils down to that relationships with with men who are unconscious about going about them or a very dangerous thing to get involved in. And they can be very dangerous even if you are conscious uh, about and, what's going on. And the hypocritical thing, too, is that, you know, when they talk about paternity fraud and, okay, so, you know, she had the milkman's kids, but, you know, he was their dad and he raised them as his own and oh. he didn't even know they weren't his until, you know, he found out when one of the kids needed a kidney or something like that. And, you know, oh, you know, so, but, I mean, you it shouldn't matter. DNA shouldn't matter. And I'm I'm looking at this these two women in uh, France about ten years ago whose babies were switched at the hospital, and they got like two and a half million euros in compensation for that because they discovered it when their daughters were fifteen. That you know, and they loved their daughters, but it mattered. The DNA mattered to them. Each of them went home with a daughter. It shouldn't, DNA shouldn't matter. Yeah. Well, apparently it matters to women. So what is gynocentrism? I'm starting to learn, like, is that just like putting women on a pedestal, essentially? That's one definition. I think it's a, a long standing for about the past thousand years since the, 
what am I looking for? The advent of romantic chivalry blended with our natural biological predispositions, but it basically boils down to women matter, men don't. Everything about women matters. Their health matters more. It's why we have a, a department on women's health in the government and, and nothing for men. Uh, it's why the courts are biased. It's why the relationship rules are rigged to disadvantage men from the beginning. Uh, we are supposed to be like seals clapping our flippers together for a piece of fish and balancing a beach ball on our nose in order to win the, the favor of women. Uh, I mean, there's a million different ways that gynocentrism is expressed, but I think that really does sum it up. It's just about women being elevated uh, in importance over men in all yeah, matters. I, I think I think when when you look, because I, I look at it at less from a sociological or historical context and more from an evolutionary biological context. And I think that when it comes to patriar patriarchy and gynocentrism are effectively uh, fed by the same core impulses uh, that are determined by our wetware, right? So this is our operating system. It's not the software that it's not the apps that we install afterwards, you know, culture and stuff like that. The apps can be very bad. And I think that modern gynocentrism is very much a set of really toxic apps. But this is a fundamental operating system. Uh, it's the it's what got us through the pla Pleistocene, the mass extinction during the Pleistocene, um, which is patriarchy is basically the recognition of, of paternity and gender roles, right? Gender division of labor in, in terms of patriarchy is, is the ring of soldiers and hunters that surrounds the village and gynocentrism is the women who are kept safe within that village to get down to their job of producing more people right of, of producing offspring so when you look at when you look at it in that way you can see it as something that is actually it's it's evolutionarily it makes sense it's you know it's why six other hominid species went extinct during the Pleistocene. Um, the Neanderthalers being the most famous, they didn't have a gendered division of labor. Men, women, and children all engaged in big game hunting, and their skeletons have the fractures to prove it, right? Female, male, and child. So you're looking at, you know, once they came across, and they didn't have any domestic arts at all, other than what they borrowed from, from us. So basically what you're looking at is something that is actually really, really well established to promote survival, uh, to promote community uh, cohesion, right? This gender division of labor, that the gender roles for men and women, men protect humans, women produce humans, right? And that's just, that's just how it works. And it worked really well. Then you got into all of these stages where well, we can give women a little bit more freedom. Oh, well, we can give women a little bit more power. Oh, we can give women a little bit more choice. We can give women the ability to say no when their husband says duck or hide. But we're going to still hold him responsible if she takes an arrow to the chest, right? Um, he's still the one to blame because he couldn't protect her, right? Even though she didn't have to obey him. And so, I mean, you're looking at all of these corruptions of these very deeply ingrained impulses that we have that we're born with that are very hard to purge. This is why it's taken 150 years or more for men to actually start defending themselves against feminism and against this campaign of anti-male hate is because they have it it's counter to their natural impulses which are to protect and provide for women you know because that's the best way to protect and provide for their offspring right their their it's, own offspring it's... and their communities so it's like you you look at it and it's it's just this massive hijacking of massive corrupt hijacking of our natural impulses that are in my opinion, pragmatic and morally neutral. And we've just changed them and changed them and changed them and changed them and always to ease up the rules for women. And then somebody has to pick up that slack. So the rules get more, more harsh on men, you know, and like back in the day, uh, when um when you had uh if a woman was raped it was at least against the law right and it was against the law because she might end up with a baby right that's basically the reason it was against the law she might end up with a baby that 
did not, that was born, would be born, that would disadvantage her and it would be disadvantaged and all of that because no father, you know, around to support them and all of that stuff, right? It's not even just not a crime to lie about birth control. It's written into Canadian law that a woman who sabotages or lies about birth control cannot be prosecuted for sexual assault. And that was written into a decision finding a man who poked holes in the condoms guilty of sexual assault. I'd like to back up a little bit and respectfully push back on some of that. I don't agree with the biodeterminism in this at all. Um, Social customs around men and women have evolved and changed for centuries. There is, it's hard for me to imagine a significant number of men, which we're starting to see nowadays, even having the opportunity to go red pill if if this is so biologically determined, uh, I I don't I don't I get think that, it's and, just and, not, and I don't I, think it serves us as a model because it it takes choice out of the hands of men. I mean, factually, I think it's incorrect because we just have so much social history around gynocentrism uh, and its evolution uh, in socially with human beings. That I mean, predating romantic chivalry, courtly love, uh, people didn't even get married for love. They got married for practicality. And, yeah, and that was all there was to it. Yeah. But I just, I mean, I in the end, if a guy ends up in a place where he understands some model, some understanding of gynocentrism and can use that that model or that knowledge to protect himself, I, I think he's in good shape. But I prefer. Uh, a little bit more personal control over my destiny than biology would allow me. Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that this is something that's written in stone. I'm saying that people have to have a meta awareness of what's going on in order to curtail their own impulses and their own even 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 I even I have a problem. You remember the the Egyptian woman in the blue bra? Remember that video? Yep. Even I was horrified by that, and I had to watch it a second time to see what was going on with the men around and how they were getting much more brutally beaten. And lots of MRAs uh, left comments under that video where I talked about it, and they said they went, they didn't even realize that the men who were getting beaten in the same frame, right? were completely they they were completely oblivious to those men and then they had to go back and watch and see how much more brutally those men were being treated by Egyptian police than that one woman right and they had to go back and watch cuz they were like oh no she was like absolutely brutally stomped when in reality the moment her burqa fell open and they realized oh there is actually a woman under here cuz a lot of men in the middle east will put on a burqa to make trouble because women are supposedly off limits for for state violence that they uh they realized that the moment her burqa fell open and and it was clear that that she was a woman one of the cops pushed another cop was like in the process of jumping and you know going to kick her and he pushed her away and pushed that cop so, away wait, so i have a question so are, are you saying paul you're saying you don't think it's biological gynocentrism i think there's biological elements to it absolutely yeah. I, don't, I don't think we can deny that but i i think we also to just identify oh, it as a biological mechanism alone i think misses oh, the point okay you you so, no you can't so, you can't capitulate to it. I mean, like it is biological in the sense that women want what they want when they want it, and as much as they can get. You know, like yes, social norms between men and women have changed through the centuries and all of that, right? But what what's always the core pattern, right? Think men make the environment safe, uh, and then women decide they want to go outside, and then they demand their men let them go outside, they demand their men let them have freedom, so the men say okay, and then they the women demand more and more freedom, and more and more autonomy, and more and more agency, and more and more ability to make their own decisions, and not have to be obedient, or not have to like capitulate to any kind of restrictions, and uh, and then, boom, Yeah, now you collapses. can be a fat whore and still be a wife. And, and, then, and then we're back then we're back to subsistence living where women actually have to be obedient to their husbands because they actually really depend on their husbands and that things aren't safe and nothing's plentiful mm-hmm. and everybody's starving and and, and this uh, is so- why cato the elder said two thousand years ago if you make women your equals they'll become your
your masters. That's right. right. So um, you said before a thousand years ago, there was no romantic love. I, there, I'm oh, saying there, the, the I'm whole sure there was idea. Romantic love. I mean, there was but, infatuation. I think that always has it. The release of oxytocin, uh, chemical yeah. infatuation, bonding between human beings was always there, but it was regarded as a form of insanity, generally socially. <laughs> and, and, People saw no reason. The idea of getting married based on that infatuation would be was considered absolute insanity. It just yeah. Your parents happen. would be so disappointed. It, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but then uh, a woman, Eleanor of Aquitaine, her daughter Marie, commissioned troubadours, uh, spread the word of romantic love and its elevation above all other forms of love, um, and it caught on. And it's it has come to be our standard ever since. Yeah, no. And and what I find interesting about that, too, is that it's elevated above all other forms of love, including the love of God, which, you know, and love of king. Atheist, yeah. Even as an atheist. Right. I, I can say, you know, for the time, that was a pretty ballsy statement. And really, really, I, I can't even imagine how she wasn't like strung up on a rack. I mean, wasn't weren't they still well, burning witches and it's stuff? It's because that William, um, her uh, her her father, I, I believe her father or grandfather, grandfather, um, was I think the world's first simp, uh, carrying an image of his mistress on his shield into battle, uh, and he was what inspired them. They grew up watching him simp for all the women in his court. Uh, and they turned it into a cottage industry that mm -hmm. spread throughout the world. And is that where, because I, I had this thought wondering if proposals were almost gynocentric because, or like, oh, yeah. I was thinking more like feminist because the guy's like going below the woman. And I, I never, I never thought about it. It's like kind of, he's on his knee. Yeah. I was like, he's <laughs> on his knees begging <laughs> yeah. her to wow. be his economic dependent for the rest of his life. And he's purchasing her with a ring that cost him three months' salary. Well, and even I had a thought. I started Googling the average price of a wedding. And I was thinking about how the price of weddings has gone up, but the value of brides is, like, so low. Because I, I oh. had this thought where, because I got into the red pill, and they're like, what modern women bring nothing. And I'm like, what do you mean we bring nothing? And, and then I started going through the stats, and I was like, oh, shit. We've, like, as a group, one out of three of us has had an abortion. One out of three has an STD. I'm like, we have, like, one point something kids. I'm like, god damn, this is not good, guys. We're, we're with a shout out to Aaron Clary, there's lots of women who want to get married and have families. There's very few who want to be wives and mothers. Yeah. Yeah, that that was really the, the thing, you know, like it, it wasn't hard for me to find my first husband. Uh, you know, he find a man who was willing to actually go into a marriage, a very traditional marriage, right, with, with the stay at home mom. Uh, at least in as much as possible financially. And um, even when I went back to work, uh, our kids never went to daycare. Uh, they were never with a babysitter. They, you know, uh, I just took jobs that were on opposite shifts from my husband and he stayed home. One of us was home with them. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, I did a whole bunch of really traditional things uh, around the house. You know, I cooked from scratch. I bought cloth diapers that you have to hold, fold and pin. You know, I, I rescued and refurbished furniture. I did everything I possibly could to uh, squeeze every bit of value out of every single penny so that I could afford to stay home. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult, I think, to find uh, a woman these days who would be willing to not just do all of those things domestically, including being the handyman around the house and things like that, plunging your own toilet and and all of those things because this is what you know i was basically a farm wife living in a small town mm -hmm. um but uh it's it's hard to find a woman like that and uh and it's hard to find a woman who's who's willing to actually commit to that lifestyle right like so uh, to find one comp you, you can't even find a woman who can cook these days half the time right you know, they know how to microwave a lean cuisine. That's about it. And um, yeah, like they and they and one who's willing to commit long term, right? Like long term, at least until the kids are basically grown and uh, next to impossible to find somebody who 
actually wants to do those things. Um, it was not hard for me to find a man who wanted to live that way. Yeah, it that's what that's what I found. Too. But there's go ahead. There's been positive in that though, in that uh, you know, in my household, I'm in a relationship of 21 years now, very happily connected in that way. But uh, I I am the cook in the house because I don't want to eat inferior food. Um, <laughs> that's that's what my oldest says. He says uh, he's the cook because uh, he and my uh, daughter live together. They share a duplex, and um, they're because they're like fifteen months apart. Like they're just like uh, joined at the hip, kind of. And um, but yeah, he does all the cooking because he wouldn't eat the the swill that Rachel makes. So but you know yeah. something, I, I gotta say, and I, and I hope women someday wake up to this. If you can be replaced by somebody who can push a broom and use a skillet, maybe you're not bringing enough to a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, if he can, uh, if he can pay uh, 200, $300 a week to have somebody come in and do those services, including the dick sucking um, once a week, uh, then, you know, like, why are you here? Right. You, you have to, you have to actually bring some kind of, and you know, sex is part but, of that, of course, so, because, um, a, no, no man gets married just praying that he'll never have sex again. Yeah. Well, that was um, the, that was like a red <laughs> pill too. I was like, are these wives not sleeping with their husbands? I was like, what? It's oh, so, con I didn't realize how common oh, it was. Like I started it, interviewing like, these guys in divorce go. and it was always like the same story. It was like, oh, she, it was like an accidental pregnancy early on. Then he marries her and then she just stopped sleeping with him after the kids. I was like, what the hell? Yeah. She'll stop sleeping with him. He'll go sexless for three years and then she'll wig out because she finds out he's looking at porn. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's the insane thing. Yeah. No, this, this madam in Australia, she wrote a piece in, I think it was a Sydney morning Herald or something like that, where she basically was saying wives be better, right? Because she says she, she wrote that half of her escorts, right? When they go on a date, there's not even any sex. They lie in bed with the guy and cuddle. And he tells them all of his heart's deepest secrets across the pillow because he can't safely disclose those things to his wife. He does not feel safe to do that. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. So these guys are paying like $200 an hour for somebody to pill, talk pill, to <laughs> pillow therapy. Oh my gosh. Do you know what I started right. asking guys? I'd be like, okay, if you're on a first date and a girl just said to you, I don't know anything. I know nothing, but I'm willing to learn. Would you go on another date with her? They're all like, yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I would I would shit test her a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, well, but you'd go you'd go on a no, second but I was, date. I, I know, but so I was just could, thinking, yeah. I was just thinking like, wow, that's like the bar is so low. They're like, I can teach her. She listens. That's it. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> well, I tell you what, that's more than a lot of guys get. Yeah. yeah. Do you think feminism was responsible for the breakdown of relationships today? Or do you think it started before that? Syner I think it's a synergism of sort of the, the modern day simp and feminism. I mean, it, it's really easy to point the finger at feminism. It's such a corrupt ideology uh, practiced by very corrupt, selfish, narcissistic, often personality disordered people so it's an easy target, and it's certainly deserving of the criticism that it gets. Uh, but I think that the, the social gynocentrism that we practice today, the 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 way men just capitulate to, to totally disrespecting themselves, life on their knees, groveling before women, that is a really big problem. I would argue worse than feminism. Wait, so yep. just quick, can I have a couple examples of that? Well, I, I think that... Um, I'll give you a, a short story as an example. I was furniture shopping with my partner a few years back, and we were picking out a new sofa for the living room. And the salesman happened to be an African-American man, I'd say in his mid-40s, uh, had a, a, a crucifix on his lapel, nice Armani suit, very sharp dress guy. And he's showing us around, and three or four times he made reference saying, we all know who's making the decision here, don't we? Yeah. His, his implication was that I had no voice in this purchase 
that I was about to make, that I had to defer to her. And I finally turned to him and said, you know what? That's not how it works here. Yeah. And he was shocked. He was yeah. absolutely stunned that I said something like that. That's one of 10 million examples. Man, if you want to see simping, go on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see it everywhere. And, Guys yeah. running to the rescue of the most vicious, nasty hoes you can possibly imagine. Guys rushing in to defend her honor and to defend all women's honor. Paul, but it's she prays. something you can actually do. But it's she absolutely prays. disgusting. It's she the prays. most disgusting. Uh, to me, these guys are worse than men who, who actually do abuse women. And they're much more common, much more common. You think they're worse than men that abuse women? Yes, I do. I think they do more damage yeah. uh, in what they ro role model to young men, uh, to boys and to girls uh, in terms of what their expectations are of men. They set future men up to have to emulate that behavior in order to stay in good social graces. Yeah. And, well, I, yeah, and I think I terrible. think that yeah, no, I think because the reason that it is the reason it's more dangerous, the reason it's more uh, insidious, is because it is considered the socially appropriate way for men to to behave. Um, you know, everybody everybody is horrified when a man strikes a woman when a man hits a woman, everybody is like, there's no normalizing that you go back a hundred, 200, 400, 500 years. Nobody liked it when that happened. Right. Nobody at all, not even the Catholic church in the 1450s. Right. Um, they did not like spousal abuse. They did not like anybody, any man raising a hand to any woman. Um, it was just not something that was considered socially acceptable. People would turn and look away they would pretend not to see it but they had to turn and look away from it they weren't saying yeah yeah you tell her how it is hit punch her again they weren't doing that they weren't doing that right but, but now they'll freak out if you disagree with a woman yeah yelling is abuse well. now i guess that's what Crowder was just abusing his wife, you know. All the or the silent, the silent treatment is also spousal abuse. By and men gaslighting. I learned just this. I'm refusing like refusing to talk to her. <laughs> yes. Oh, isn't that stonewalling? Isn't that what they say? <laughs> these psychologists oh, make up these like crazy terms. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? That sounds it's... like a good a term as any. I haven't heard stonewalling, but I don't doubt that they're using it because they. You can take any normal form of behavior in men. And it will be called abusive, and the opposite of that behavior will be called ab abusive too. So it just it really doesn't matter. Well, and it's interesting. I I didn't under I think the first time we talked, I was like, wow, this guy really hates sim. But it's weird. It's like yeah. once you once you like see it, you can't unsee it. Where you're like, shit, they're just like lying. Like women, it's like okay, we're just such idiots. I mean, I like I mean, not all of us, but a lot. Like we just believe damn near anything. It's so crazy. But it's like the guys like. Uh, they know. So I'm like, why are you lying? Like, they'll come on my show and say they like women that have slept around. They'll come on the show and say there's nothing wrong with their 37-year-old sister who's never dated anybody. And I'm just like, like you know that's not true. Like, why? And it's just like, once you see it, you just can't. God, I'm like, do I hate Look Sims? at all the people that say women can do anything men can do, which is oh, God. patently untrue. It's it's so untrue that it's it's laughable. <sighs> laughably untrue and the whole of society will nod their heads like bobbleheads oh yeah no when barack obama said a woman can do anything a man can do uh and better and in heels and everybody's like oh yeah oh yeah and i'm just like are you are you freaking kidding me get up there in that cherry picker and fix that power pole bitch <laughs> Well, and I played sports, so like uh, I'm like, you realize how much stronger dudes are? I'm like, I'm like top one percent if you look at how tall I am. Strength, yeah. it's probably similar. I could deadlift like 300 pounds. That's a, that's a lot for a chick, but for a oh, chick, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, a, even an average guy can out bench me. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's not, <laughs> and it's like I've trained 16 years to out bench or out deadlift. Like, I don't know, a couple guys maybe who don't train yeah. and are obese, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no. And it's like you're looking at the Canadian uh, Olympic uh, women's hockey team. You know, they spar with um, not even midget AAA, 
but uh, basically the up to 15 year old category, well, right? Mid to triple A is 15 do. to 18. And uh, they practice with them and they routinely lose. The Australian women's soccer team, they train, they, they train against uh, 15 and under boys teams. And they routinely lose. Well, and they, all they do is and, complain. They whine about the pay when I'm like, you're lucky to even have a league. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I was they, like, they complain about the pay that they're actually getting by siphoning off of men's sports, which is exactly yeah. what happens. That is, I literally said, I was like, if I was the guys, I would just cut it because I was like, they all we do is complain and bitch about the pay. I'm like, I would just cut it. I would just cut the whole league. You want to bitch about it? And I loved sports, mm-hmm. but I'm like, no one's watching it. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and the, the idea that you're going to get, the idea that you're going to get male fans of, say the NBA, right, of basketball, to watch women's basketball is, is laughable. I mean, maybe there will be some, no. um, but not a lot. And women just generally aren't sports fans in particular, right? Like they, I went to a hockey game once. It was, it was, we don't normally go to, even though my husband was a hockey player and, and, you know, he, uh, uh, he, he really likes the sport. Um, we don't we don't go to hockey games, but uh, it was part of a Christmas party or something like that that his uh, his employers uh, bought everybody hockey tickets, and we went there and we we were seated next to these two couples, and the guys were like totally into the game, and the two women with their probably two hundred dollars a piece tickets seats just sat there and gossiped the whole time. They didn't even notice when someone scored. My dad's totally done that with me where they, he brings me to like really good like seats for like a game or whatever. I don't care. And I played sports <laughs> and I don't even like watching it. <laughs> like, and I played. <laughs> I'm like I talking think that's to my the, sister. The one thing all those women who come to, to high dollar sporting events and gossip through the whole thing all have in common is that they did not pay for those tickets. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I go with my dad. <laughs> Well, I mean, like I, I was on my feet cheering and stuff because, hey, this is my hometown. It's my hometown team, Edmonton Oilers. And they were playing real good against the Vancouver Canucks. And I hated the fucking Vancouver Canucks. And uh, because they betrayed me. But um, with their stupid goalie, Dan Cloutier, curse you. But um, but yeah, no, I actually had to stop watching hockey for about 10 years because of that guy. Back when I was living in British Columbia. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's like uh, you you have... Uh, a very small pool of women who are actually interested in sports in terms of buying tickets. Like I'm not in terms of buying tickets, I'm not interested. And then um, in terms of, uh, of actually watching the games and being interested in sports in general, it, you know, you've, you've got very, very low numbers of women who are, who are likely to, they, they literally went, somebody, somebody literally went out on the street and offered somebody a free ticket to uh, a WNBA game or a $1 oh, dollar bill. <laughs> and the dude took the $1 bill you know so crazy? and he just went around I between played, people. I played, I think maybe. And they all took the dollar bill. You know, it's so funny. I'm 26, I'm about 27. I think I started playing basketball when I was like six or seven. I played for 20 years. I would pick the $100 bill. It, well, it was a $1 would, bill or something. It was, it was like it. It was I way go. less value than the ticket. So, I think the ticket was only worth I'm, $20. I'm bucks. curious. How has social media changed relationships between men and women? Um, because when I, when social media came to the scene, I was pretty young. So I think I got my first like Facebook when I was in eighth grade. So I was like 12, maybe. So it, it like as far as I really remember, social media has just always been there. But I'm curious from your point of view, like how has I think it changed? It's changed it for the better? Really? Um, I, yeah, I think we're seeing the beginnings of changes for the better. The thing that is so great about social media is that the alternative narrative to this romantic model, this gynocentric bullshit that's been running the world is that that stuff would never be expressed first in real world real real world terms you would not you don't have people at parties you know talking about screw marriage i would never ever trust a woman with all my assets and walk into the family courts that's not party discourse in real world terms but through social media we have the opportunity to 
spread information and to talk about an alternative way for men to view their own lives in ways that we've never had before. It's why we have red pill movements, why we have MGTOW. It's why we've got a lot of things going on that would, you know, there was like versions of, of MGTOW in the past bachelor's clubs and stuff like that. Very, very small portion of the population. But very local. It, yeah. And nowadays it's it's worldwide. And it's amazing how many men actually do start rethinking their own lives when, the, when they start getting exposed to information that makes them see things that they've been trained to not see their whole lives. Uh, I think it has a great positive impact in that way. It's going to be rough and bloody at first. I think men need to uh, honestly, we're seeing men now finally getting in touch with their anger about this lopsided deal that they've always had. And that sentiment is growing. There's going to be growing pains involved in that. We're talking about, you know, we talked about the, the slowness of this before. Keep in mind that from Seneca Falls until women got voting rights was 70 years. And it was another 40, 50 years after that before gender feminism raised its ugly head in society. These things are like big lumbering ships. They're not like sports cars that turn on a dime and change directions. Uh, but it's happening. And I think it's happening on a bigger scale. It's why you see so much panic in the so-called conservative right about men who won't get married and who are challenging all this stuff. Uh, uh, this is starting to scare people, which it ought to do. Yeah, no, I I would say too, I mean, like it, it, social media has turned dating into Twitter, you know, and, and not just social media, but like these dating apps, Bumble and Tinder and Grindr and all of that stuff. I mean, even online dating, even internet dating is not what it was when I was doing it. When I met my husband, my the one that just put coffee in the microwave, uh, if I freeze up, that's why. It really has sort of cheapened the whole process of dating. But it's also, I think, woken a lot of men up to the fact that, you know, you can you can be a reasonably attractive guy, a six or a seven. Uh, you can have a good income. You can have, you know, be in a good place in your life. You know, like I, I own a condo and uh, and I work as, um, as a technician or an engineer or something like that. And I make 80K a year and, uh, and I'm I'm doing good and I'm debt free and all of that stuff. Right. And swipe left, swipe left, swipe left, woman after woman, swipe left, swipe left. Cause you're five, 10, you're not six feet tall. Right. Or because you're, uh, you have a bit of a, uh, of a big nose or, you know, or you're not, uh, you're, you haven't, it's, it's, oh, they'll only date six and six, six feet, six figures. Right. And, uh, and that's it. So I think it's, I think not just social media and the spreading of the word on social media, sort of the democratization of information that occurs through social media. It's not just that. It's men's experience of women's absolute pickiness and their, their unbelievably high standards. So you got, you've got an overweight woman, right? Who says, I won't date anyone less than six feet tall. And if the guy asks her, well, how much do either. you weigh? They won't date fat guys either. I've interviewed these chicks. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. And, you know, like I used to write smut for women, right? And there was a whole genre of smut for women called BBW, Big Beautiful Woman. And she was always Lizzo and he was always freaking Brad Pitt. Yeah. I, I, I just uh, to dovetail a little bit off of what Karen just said, the way I look at it is that on the other side of men getting better, more information and seeing women more clearly than they ever have, we have the negative effects of social media dating apps in that you have women's that are literally threes and fours who behave and act like they're eights and nines because of all the attention they get through dating apps. They misinterpret this flood of male attention, which is just how men are uh, chasing women. They misinterpret that as making them more valuable than they are. I'm sure a lot of those women don't get any dates at all that are ever going to satisfy them. Well, right. yeah, well, they, they start to think they look like they're filters. It's like a weird <laughs> phenomenon. No, I swear. I, so these girls will come on my show and I'm like, I'll be talking to them. And sometimes I'll follow them on Instagram after. And I'm like, 
who is this? Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> or or sometimes they'll take a picture like with me after the show, and and I don't really use filters like that, but they they'll it's like automatic when you take a picture, and I'm like, God damn, like this just gave me like two points. This is amazing. Like I'm like, but they start to think they're actually that hot with these filters. Yeah. They like automatically make your nose a little smaller, your smile a little wider, your skin a little smoother. I'm like. I think these chicks like literally think they look like that. Yeah, no, and it, I'm looking at myself right now and it's like I haven't worn makeup in 10 years and you know, there's this thing, it runs in my dad's family um where once you hit 50, what used to be flatteringly described as natural eyeshadow because I never had to wear eyeshadow because I always had natural darker coloring on my eyelids. Right now it just becomes raccoon eyes. And um, yeah, no. So I, I'm I'm looking at myself and I'm just like, well, what the fuck do I care? I'm 52 years old. I'm not on the market. Now these like you'll see these like Madonna 50 something year old chicks where they're like they're it's like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Stretch, stretch real tight. Yeah. yeah. No, they've had. That's, that's so appealing. <laughs> yeah. They've had they've had 13 adjustments of their little cranks to like pull the. And like 30 the, years. Uh, the the. Bone. the, the the leather face a little bit tighter. Well, and they were trying to market um, Botox to me like in my early 20s. Like I I had, yeah, and I'm like, what the fuck? What do I need Botox? I'm like 24. (laughs) Like I'm in 27 now almost. But back then I was like, I was 24. I'm like, you're ready. You want me to get on Botox? Like what's that going to look like in 20, 30 years? You're going to be like frozen. (laughs) Yeah, I've never thought that the bow portion of Botox is botulism. Yeah. All, and the tox, all the and the tox part of Botox is toxin, <laughs> botulism so, toxin. What do you, what do you, I'm curious what you guys see for the future because like for me, it's interesting because I have, I have like ideas of policies that I think were bad. So like, I don't think women really should have voted. I'm not really a fan of no fault divorce, but part of me is like, I don't know if you can go back and maybe like there's ways they have to adapt into the future. So I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not actually sure exactly what policies I'd prescribe moving forward, except that women shouldn't vote but <laughs> but i'm curious like what you guys think i don't know if my my thoughts on that is i don't focus so much on policy i really i think men's solutions certainly aren't political or legal i don't want to start building state funded battered men's shelters or 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 anything like that but what i i think has to happen in the future and probably will happen is that m- men and women will have to renegotiate a social contract at some point to something that is more fair. And I would also say, I think there's going to be a long time uh, before that happens where women find out what it's like to live in a population of men who are angry and don't give a shit about their problems. I think that's coming. We've got young men in high school now are staunchly anti-feminist and moving to the right. Uh, and yet they're not embracing traditional gynocentrism at all. Uh, when this generation of men, that generation comes of age, some women are going to get some very rude awakenings. And the the sad part of it is, and I know some guys will tell me, Paul, it's not sad. It's sad to me, is that the women who are going to ultimately suffer for the sins of their mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers are not the ones who did this stuff. But they're still going to be the ones left in the lurch when men quit participating in this rigged game. So you you think that men are going to keep, like start walking away from marriage, walking away from relationships, walking away from children? They've until, already started. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Until the, the, the un- I mean, it's it's like un- that that uh, recent report came out: sixty three percent of young men uh, haven't even tried to go on a date in the last year. They're walking away, all right, and they're angry. You can't be brought up in a North American school system as a male and and not have some repressed anger or some expressed anger out of that because these guys have been shit on their their whole academic lives. Uh, it's it is, and I agree with Karen. I think it'll have to collapse first. Uh, but the beginning of the collapse is when men, generally speaking, start withdrawing support from women. When they start taking care of themselves, 
everything is going to go to hell. So especially for women. So with um, so I'm I'm curious, like, what would a more fair contract look like, and what is the collapse going to look like? Okay, well, a more fair contract, I think, would be something that could be negotiated between partners, right? Like, if I mean, like, we, my husband and I, we have a verbal, like, handshake deal, and we trust each other to hold up our ends of the bargain. And then if things get a little bit untenable for one of us, we will sit down at the bargaining table and see if we need to renegotiate. Right. And that's how we do things. We actually look at, we actually kind of approach the relationship very similar to a contract. It's, it's, it is actually, you know, this is what I agreed to do. That's what you agreed to do. So part of that might actually be introducing something that Muslims have been doing for uh, ages, which is um, the not the bride gift, but the actual contract where you hash out exactly what's expected of each partner um, before you tie the knot. But honestly, I think that uh, I think that one of the things that you could do policy wise that would really put a damper on women's willingness to throw away marriages is default shared parenting, right? Because, you know, you can only read so many articles with titles like the agony of being a 50 50 mom, very sympathetic. Oh, these poor women, right? They missed their, they might have missed their daughter's first steps or their son's first words because he was, they were with their dad at the time, right? And, you know, and she has to share custody 50% with her, her ex husband. And, and it's just so horrible for these women. Well, yeah, if it's that horrible, let's freaking implement it. And maybe these women won't be so quick to throw away their husbands. I personally, uh, I think a part of the negotiation is an individual thing. Um, 25 years ago, I made the decision that, hey, if you're gainfully employed, you better find your fucking purse when the check arrives and, and carry your share. Because I don't care if I had $10 million in the bank, I wouldn't finance a relationship with a woman. Um, and I, I, and there were times uh, before I met my current partner that, uh, yeah, I sprang for a couple of dinners so I could get sex. Okay, no problem. Uh, it wasn't well received in the end, but, you know, that's the game. <laughs> I chose to play it better than they did. Uh, but for me, it starts with, with personal accountability financially. If you have to show up bringing your your labor, your sweat to the relationship in order to help build it, it gives you a better investment in it. And it, it, it doesn't end up with men getting used for their money. Uh, there's nothing that, that I hate more than to hear a woman complain, just because you bought me dinner doesn't mean you get to have sex. Well, then pay for your own fucking dinner. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like that. If you don't want to hear that shit from men, pay your own way. And, and yeah. of course, if you if you insist it now, I lost. Uh, I went through probably twenty women before I met my partner, who once they came up against that financial wall, decided they weren't so interested in me, and that was just fine with me because I saved myself another divorce rape uh, yeah. by going for a, a little bit better class of woman. If a woman expects to be able to make money and to, to pay her own bills and to have her own autonomy and, and independence make equal life, pay. But, but not contribute to a relationship financially, yeah. she's a hoe. Yep. Do you think there'll ever be a return to traditionalism? Yes. Yeah, I do too. You know, like, okay, 33 trillion, 33.1 trillion in debt. It's not a whole lot better in Canada. My kids, my older two kids were born each with owing $38,000 in taxpayer debt. During COVID, that went up to more than $100,000 that all three of my kids owe to future creditors, to, to people collecting on those debts in the future. So, you know, you're, you're looking at a, a, the system that we've set up that basically it sticks a, an expensive, bloated, bureaucratic middleman in between men and women. So where whereas a man and a woman would get together and they would bargain, they would decide between them how they wanted their relationship to work and who does what and all of those things, right? And they would get together, they would raise children. What we now have is a situation where you have this gigantic, bloated, money-hungry middleman taking a cut 
of every transfer of money that goes from men to women. I mean, like when you look at child support laws, Title 4D, basically what that did was it said, well, for every dollar of child support money, a state child support agency can extract, forcibly extract from a man, they will get a dollar in federal transfers. So the state is basically... What the state does is they say, okay, well, we're we're going to pay for you to be on welfare and support your kids, but we don't want to pay the whole cost of that, right? So we're going to go after the father of these kids and extract every single penny of child support money we can from him, and we're going to deduct that off of your welfare check. So the children will be no better off, but we will, because then for every dollar we extracted from that man, we get another dollar from the federal government in grant money. Yay, federal transfers. Woo, we've doubled our money by nailing men to the wall and letting women do whatever the fuck they want. And nobody's better off. Everybody's worse off. And this whole system is only held together by the illusion of our great grandchildren's projected productivity. That's it. That's it. That's all that's holding it together. $33.1 trillion. That falls on the working people today and next generation and the next generation and the next one, right? To pay that back or just let it keep ballooning. And once we can no longer afford to pay to sustain this system, and men and women have to go back to actually bargaining as individuals mm -hmm. as to what they want their relationships to look like and, and work like and all of that, right? Then you're going to see some women willing to actually sit down at the negotiating table because they don't have that bureaucratic muscle standing behind them going, no, nah, you're going to pay and you're going to pay what we tell you. How long right? do you think it'll be till that happens, till they stop like backing up women's bad decisions with child support, alimony and government. I hope benefits. it's, I hope it's till the day after I die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, me too. Like I, I, well, I, I hope it when my kids die, if I don't have grandchildren, because like it, it's going to be, it's not going to be a pleasant transition. Women are going to be so used to getting all of this free stuff, you know, and when you look at New Zealand, and the, the numbers they came out with a few years ago, where they actually looked at the cumulative contribution into the tax system of men and women, right? From birth to death, go. right? <laughs> and they found that the only people who actually pay taxes, men. who actually pay net taxes, are men between the ages of four and 65, 40 and 65. That's when those are the only people who are actually contributing, putting in more than they take out. And they peak at 65 in, the, in terms of their net contribution. And that's when, when they retire. And then they start pulling out of the system. And by the time they're 80, they're at zero. They have made no net contribution. How do you sustain that? Right. And women never get above negative $50,000. Right? I don't think anybody can really predict with any kind of accuracy when it's going when, to happen. But, yeah. but I do believe that it will happen. And when it does, it's going to be incredibly fast and incredibly ugly. And then you will see the negotiations between men and women for the social contract are going to change radically after that collapse. It'll be like, oh, it's going to be just it'll like, be like the women dead. like run to their friend yeah. zone. They're I'll, like, I'll say in camp, they're if like, you go hunt the zombie. They're like, they're like, oh shit, you know, all those years I put you in the friend zone. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. I just, I was so silly. I just didn't I, recognize how hot you were. Yeah, I just, yeah, no, you're my, you're you're the Tom Hanks to my Meg I, Ryan. You know what? You're like the hottest guy I've ever seen in my life. Ever. I just yeah. don't even because you're the one who's like willing to, to touch my vagina and like <laughs> protect me. Thank you guys for coming on. The guy. <laughs> This is actually interesting because I've been thinking a lot about like what, you know, the future holds with everything that's going on. So it's kind of interesting to talk to people that have had a little bit more time to think about this stuff. So um, thank you guys both for coming on. Um, could you tell the people where they could find you? OK, you can find me at paulelam.com. But more importantly, go to paulelam.com forward slash X, Y crew and read up about what we're doing with our men's groups talking about all of this stuff 
and figuring out how we're dealing with this through life. It's great stuff. You can join us there. And you can find me on my channel, Girl Writes What, on YouTube. It's fairly defunct, but it has like a massive hours and hours and hours of back catalog that are could easily serve. And I was actually learning when I was doing those. So, I mean, it would be like a great primer for anybody who's interested in any of these things to kind of go back and watch, watch those videos in order. And you can also find me on the site formerly known as Prince, uh, I mean, Twitter uh, under at Girl Writes What. And uh, I also have a blog that I rarely post on, but occasionally do called owningyourshit.blogspot.com. Um, you can go there and I have a very recent post uh, that details all the reasons why. Yeah. Also, please come follow me on Twitter at, at Real Paul Elam. Yeah. At Real Paul Elam. Yeah, he's, yes. he's always, but he's I'm always at. I have the blue girl. check mark, I'll yeah. have you know. Yeah. Oh. He's always <laughs> at in these simps too. It's awesome. I'm always retweeting. We we went up yeah. the Daily Wire no, this he... weekend. It was, it was awesome. I was like, this is amazing. I went from watching these guys to tweeting at him and they're recognizing me i'm like what a day yeah no the 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 simps the simps really need to be uh saved yeah right they need to be rescued from themselves yeah well and it's also like oh my gosh once you can't you can't unsee it like the nagging wife so it's like you can kind of you can kind of see who's like controlled by their wives based on like the things they say or like because they're all mad (laughs) The, the Daily Wire was mad a couple months ago because I put, let me ask my wife with a barfing emoji next to it. <laughs> <laughs> they are easily triggered over and they're there. Like, and they're like, well, what if she's my assistant? And I'm like, uh, I mean, I have an assistant. I certainly don't ask her. Like, like I tell her what I'm doing. I don't ask her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I might ask, like, I might ask, like, what am I, like, what's the schedule this week? But I'm not asking permission. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, You'd make a make a lousy simp. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, okay, guys, um, make sure you go follow, subscribe to both of them, and get yourself a women should have vote t-shirt today. Look, these women, we've just gotten out of control. You know, I I might even make a simp shouldn't vote t-shirt either. I know you guys, I've heard you. I, it's not just women, okay, but it's got to start with the women because it's just I, I don't even understand these campaigns. We just believe anything. You see the clothes they convince us to wear? Like this is crazy, all right? Um, all right, so like the video guys subscribe to the channel um thank you guys for coming on and i'll talk to you next time